Okay, members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. Questions number three and topical question number nine are withdrawn. I will call Cahill Boylan to ask the first question. Cahill Boylan. Kesh Devrahian, let a whole question number one, please. Minister. I recognise that many in the local community support the safety improvements which are being proposed along the A1 between Hillsborough Roundabout and Lockbrook Island. In particular, I am very aware how important the A1 improvements are for the many people who have expressed their support, especially those who have lost loved ones. A public inquiry into the A1 Junction's Phase 2 road improvement scheme was held from the 11th to the 13th of March 2020. Following the inquiry, the inspector undertook a number of site meetings to ensure that he gave full consideration to all the issues raised. Whilst these site meetings were delayed by the COVID-19 restrictions, they have now been completed, and the inspector issued his report to the department yesterday. My officials will require some time to fully consider the inspector's proposals and recommendations, and when I have been appraised of the findings, I will consider carefully and decide on the next steps for this important scheme. I am keen to progress the A1 Junctions Phase 2 road improvement project to the next stage as quickly as possible, whilst of course completing all of the necessary statutory processes and securing the necessary funding. Uh, I can call you and could I welcome the, the Minister's uh, answers, but the Minister is well aware that many people who use the road on a daily basis are keen to have these improvements in place, especially for road safety. Can she give the House any indication as to when this scheme will commence for to improve road safety on this road? And I agree with the member on the importance of this road in terms of road safety, but also for connectivity, given its strategic importance. And I want to assure him that I am keen to progress the scheme to the next stage as quickly as possible. The precise timescales will depend on the outcome of the public inquiry, the consideration of the report. But I want to assure him that I am keen to progress this. I recognise its importance. I have met with Mr and Mrs Heaney, who tragically lost their son, Carl, and I have given them my commitment to move forward on this scheme as quickly as practically possible. And I will keep members updated. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers. And the safety of all road users should be a priority. The Minister will be aware of the work of the Motorcycle Action Group in highlighting the hazard uh, that wire rope style crash barriers present to motorcyclists in the event of a collision with one. Will the Minister give a commitment to meet with MAG with a view to working with them to look at alternative barriers for schemes such as the A1? I thank the member for her question and I recognise the concern that motorcyclists have with wire rope barriers and that this issue exists across many countries. My department is currently working to the standards applied across Europe and impacts with safety barriers of any type represent a very small proportion of the road collision statistics for motorcyclists. For all existing motorways and high flow dual carriageways, my department specifies concrete barriers for central reserves as part of road upgrades and when existing barriers need replaced. My officials are currently considering the ongoing maintenance costs for wire rope safety barriers in comparison with non-tension systems, and this may change the way the department specifies safety barriers in the future. I would of course be happy to meet with the delegation and with the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary was just asked. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and thank you very much, um, Minister, for your um, answer so far. But could you provide an update, not just on the A1, but on the A5 and the A6 flagship projects, please? <laughs> Uh, yes, and I thank the member um, for her interest. Um, the A6 is progressing well. We had anticipated some impact and delay from COVID, but construction progressed back on site very quickly and we are advancing. And I was able to make uh, a bid for capital monies uh, during the recent monitoring round. In relation to the A5, again, that was subject to a public inquiry. The report has been passed to my department. My officials are given a careful consideration and obtaining legal advice before submitting a report to me and there I will decide on the next steps. Again, this is another strategic project that is of critical importance, not least to addressing regional imbalance in Northern Ireland. 
Call the Lords Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her continued commitment to this long-awaited uh, project on the A1 upgrade. But could the Minister uh, tell us how you hope to communicate and plan to communicate uh, with the public the next stage? I think it's very important. I agree with the member that there is huge interest, not just inside this house, but outside it, and great will and enthusiasm to see this progress, uh, this project progress. Um, so, as I've said, my department just received the report from the public inquiry yesterday, and we are given a careful consideration. And I have asked my officials to ensure that any communications from my department are maximised to reach members of the public, as well as members of this house, who share my keenness to see this project delivered. Next question, I call from McCann. Well, uh, could I ask the Minister how she intends to address the increasing backlog uh, in driving test appointments? Question, question. question, question never at all. With, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to answer questions 2 and 13 together. Um, the Driver and Vehicle Agency's booking system for driving tests reopened on the 5th of October and thousands of bookings have been made. At this time, the DVA has not released any driving test slots beyond January 2021. As members will be aware, driving instructors have been included in the executive's regulations on businesses that must close over the next four weeks to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Following this executive decision, driving tests will also cease over this period of increased restrictions based on public health and scientific advice. Motorcycle lessons and tests are not affected by these new restrictions. The booking service is now closed and the DVA will contact those who had their driving tests cancelled to advise them on how they can reschedule their appointments. To create additional capacity, the DVA is planning to open up the booking system for February for these impacted customers only. Further appointments will also be made available in November, December and January as the DVA increases capacity by recruiting additional examiners. These slots, when they are released, will also only be available to those impacted customers. The DVA acknowledges that learner drivers are keen to take their driving tests at the earliest opportunity and will continue to work hard to maximise the availability of test slots. However, all driving test services across these islands are experiencing high demand with longer than usual waiting times. Like all public facing services, the COVID-19 restrictions mean that the DVA has had to adapt its services to ensure that they can be provided safely and they would ask customers for their patience at this difficult time. It is my priority to ensure that our staff and customers remain safe and the DVA will continue to be guided by the latest public health and scientific advice as we work as quickly as we can to serve all of our customers. I want to thank the, the, the Minister for her answer to that question. Uh, and, but could you tell me in, in detail how many additional test slots the Department is providing to address the enormous growing backlog and driving test appointments? I can confirm to the member that prior to the new restrictions and the impact of those restrictions on driving tests, we were working very hard to increase capacity. We are in the process of recruiting 27 new extra examiners. Three have already been recruited. 12 temporary examiners are in the process of being recruited and 12 permanent examiners are in the process of being recruited. We are also offering driving tests on Saturday and exploring the options of Sunday as well while ensuring road safety conditions. Call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased that motorcycle uh, driving tests will continue, given that they follow, uh, the instructor follows in another vehicle. So that I welcome that. Uh, the minister has indicated there will be no tests for this four-week period. Likewise, instructors will not be able to uh, train students. Uh, what compensation package will be available for them? Because they will not have had a rental property uh, and may not have fit it into many of the other schemes that have been uh, presented to date. Yeah, I thank the member for his very important question. Um, he is right that driving instructors have been um, impacted by the restrictions they have been asked to close their businesses. So there is an onus and a responsibility on the executive to ensure that they receive financial support. The member is right to highlight that the driving instructors uh, will not, in many instances, qualify for the Department of Finance scheme because they don't have a rateable premise. Uh, but the Minister for Economy is working on a hardship scheme that will include those businesses that have been affected by closure. And my understanding is those businesses and the self-employed who are also impacted because their business relies very much on those that have been forced to close as a result of our restrictions. 
Call to Anne Bundy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if she, she'll confirm whether uh, those of her employees who, were, who had a dual role as both driving examiners and vehicle testers will now move back to vehicle testing to help with the number of MOTs being conducted? As the member has indicated, there are 37 driving examiners and some will continue to conduct motorcycle tests during this period, while others will be re redeployed to other areas and duties, uh, as she has highlighted, and others will be offered the opportunity to take annual leave before the services resume again. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am grateful today that uh, the Minister has provided clarity um, that the decision of the Executive to add driving instructors to the close contact lists, um, therefore meaning examiners and driving tests have had to cease to protect public health. Uh, can I ask the Minister, does she know when her Executive colleagues will bring forward support for this industry? I thank the member um, for her question. Um, and I know that the Minister for Economy and her officials are working very hard on this. Uh, this matter was discussed at the Executive on Friday, and I understand that the Minister and her officials have been working diligently uh, since then to try to bring forward a scheme which will set out very clearly the eligibility criteria that will ensure that people who were excluded previously are not excluded uh, as we learn to cope with the next four weeks and the new restrictions imposed by the Executive. Uh, next question, Andy Allen. Question four, Mr. Speaker. Before I address the member's specific question, it is important to explain that although my department has a statutory duty under Article 8 of the Roads Order to maintain public roads, there is no automatic entitlement to compensation for road users. My department investigates and defends public liability claims, with every case turning on its own facts. In cases where my officials consider the Department can raise a legal defence, claims will be repudiated. Turning to the member's specific question, I can confirm that during the six full financial years from 2014-15 to 2019-20, £13.1 million in roads-related public liability compensation was paid for vehicle damage, personal injury and property damage claims. During the same period, the Department received 18,452 public liability compensation claims and paid compensation out in 10,453 of those cases. However, I wish to make it clear that claims received in a financial year are not always concluded within the same financial year. Therefore, the figures I have provided for cases where compensation was paid out, as well as the compensation amount, will include details for claims received in prior financial years. It has been independently established that some £143 million at today's prices is needed to maintain the structural integrity of Northern Ireland's road network. However, due to budget constraints, that amount has not been available over the period in question. Supplementary, Andy Allen. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answer. Minister, uh, startling figure that you have outlined, and I appreciate what you have referenced. Minister, can you outline the average response time by the Department to respond to a reported defect? And if possible, does the Department also hold any information on the claims which have been made in that window of a defect being reported and repaired? I can confirm that during that period, uh, the breakdown uh, of compensation payments was as followed. Uh, £2 million in compensation was paid out for vehicle damage, £10.7 million was paid out in compensation for personal injury, and £410,000 was paid out for property damage claims. In terms of the average time scales, uh, the average time scale for decision uh, in respect of vehicle damage is four months. For personal injury and property damage, the average waiting time for a decision is six months. Call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for her answers. Given that substantial amount of money that has been spent in relation to compensation, um, has your department done any work to actually find out about recurring costs for the same areas of damage as opposed to just a global figure of 13 million? Because many of us will know that there are accident black spots and there are particular defects on roads that still go unchecked even after compensation has been paid. Uh, yes, in terms of investment in our roads and structural maintenance, they, my officials use a matrix uh, that they apply, which is to do with the volume of traffic on a road, but also uh, on the defects. Um, we will never have a situation where the department is not in receipt uh, of, of claims and compensation claims. I think the challenge here is that we have systematically underinvested in our road structure, and unfortunately, th this is one of the outworkings of that. But I will continue to make representations to the finance minister and executive colleagues 
colleagues to ensure that we can get the funding that we need to bring our roads up to a much better and much more improved standard. Well, Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses, perhaps reflective of an endemic lack of investment in roads maintenance. Um, can the Minister outline why only £1 million was bid for in the October monitoring round for additional roads maintenance? I have a list of roads the length of my arm that are requiring repair and maintenance in the North Down constituency, but yet people are being told to wait. Um, uh, I thank the Member um, for, his que for his question. Um, to my recollection, in the October monitoring bid, I made a capital bid for £5.5 .5 million, and four, just over £4 million of that was for um, structural maintenance. I can clarify those figures, uh, and if they are not most up to date, I can provide you with the revised figures. But please be assured, where there is any opportunity to bid for additional monies that I can ensure will be spent, I will continue to do so and to make those representations to executive colleagues. Paul Liz Cummins. Can Corla and thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, compensation figures suggest that uh, my area of Newry and the surrounding areas are, are among the highest number of claims, suggesting that the, the roads uh, have the, most, uh, the worst defects. Can the Minister um, outline how she intends to, affect, to address these issues in those um, areas that are worst affected? I thank the member for her question. Um, I allocated in this year's annual budget £75 million towards structural maintenance in line with last year. I also created a £10 million rural roads fund because I very much recognise that our rural roads uh, are under pressure and that we need to be doing more to try to improve those. I can uh, assure the member that I will continue to make representations to secure the necessary funding so that your constituency and other constituencies can see significant road improvements that they need and deserve. Next question, of course, Neil Bradley. Question five. The NSMC Transport Sectoral Meeting on Wednesday, the 7th of October, was conducted via video conference due to COVID restrictions. Eamon Ryan, TD, Minister for Transport, Gordon Lyons, MLA, as accompanying minister, and myself attended the meeting. I will be making a statement to the Assembly on the 2nd of November on the meeting, but I can report it was a hugely positive meeting and a lot of progress was made. I can confirm that a number of issues were discussed and agreed at the meeting. This included the implications of Brexit for our island. An agreement was reached on continued cooperation on transport issues in the coming months. Our response to COVID-19 in relation to transport services uh, and operations was discussed. The latest EU funding position, including the potential loss of some opportunities due to Brexit and the implications for communities here on our shared new decade, new approach uh, commitments were discussed. And importantly, we agreed that the high-speed rail feasibility uh, study would be extended to Derry and Limerick. Minister Ryan and I took this decision because we recognise the fact that the North West has for too long suffered from underinvestment in rail. We are both committed to addressing regional imbalance across the island and we also reiterated our commitment to progressing the A5, narrow water bridge, renewed air services and cross-border greenways. During the meeting, I also raised the issue of the withdrawal of bus sarin service between Belfast and Dublin. Minister Ryan and I have held a number of bilateral meetings and we continue to engage positively on how we can work together collaboratively to, deal, or to deliver for citizens and communities across our island. Neil Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I um, would like to thank the Minister for her clear commitment on the Narrow Water Bridge project and in particular thank her for visiting Warren Point and meeting with the Narrow Water Bridge community network there. Can I ask the Minister what discussion she has had with the Irish Government in terms of progressing this much needed and highly significant project for not just South Down but for the whole island of Ireland? Um, as the member rightly says, uh, I recently met with her and with representatives um, of the Narrow Water Bridge Community Group. And I know the local passion her late father had for this project that she has and those right across the local community share for this transformative project. I assure her that I share that passion too. And all my conversations to date with the Irish government have been positive in terms of delivering together on this all-island new decade, new approach commitment. At the NSMC and separately, I have engaged with Minister Ryan on progressing this important project. Uh, we will be working closely together in the next few months, and I will keep members updated on progress. Steve Egan, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her remarks so far. 
And one of the issues that she will have discussed uh, is the importance of north-south uh, communications and trade, and also the vital uh, need for the York Street interchange to be built as quickly as possible. Could the Minister reflect on where we are with the York Street interchange and the importance it has for all island and indeed all islands communications and logistics? I thank the member for his question. Yes, uh, the York Street Interchange project is a project of uh, critical importance. It's a strategic road project, but I also think that it presents uh, an opportunity to have a properly future-proof design to ensure that it is inclusive of the communities who live around it, that it meets the objectives that we have uh, as an executive, but also around the Belfast agenda, and that it's also an important way forward in terms of tackling the climate uh, emergency. The member will know that I initiated a short, sharp external review to make sure that we were for future-proofing the project, and I hope to receive that report after engagement with stakeholders around December time. Catherine, Cal Catherine McCallie, supplementary. Corlea, Minister, considering the South's recent budget announcement for funding North-South projects, can we ex expect an acceleration of the A5 construction process and for two phases to commence simultaneously? I thank the member for his question, and I very much welcomed the announcement by the Irish government of 500 million pounds uh, or million euros uh, for infrastructure projects as well. I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity for greater collaborative working uh, and to see real delivery on the ground. In respect of the A5, the member will know that that was subject to a public inquiry, that the report has been submitted, and that my officials are very carefully considering its findings while obtaining legal advice. Um, when they make the submission to me, and I can give it consideration, uh, I will be deciding on the next steps. But I do want to reassure her that I recognise the importance of this and subject to the completion of all the statutory processes, um, I would be keen to move on this as quickly as possible and will, of course, look to the Irish Government to play their part, given their financial commitment to the project. Question, Alan Chambers. Uh, question six, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I recognise the need for improved um, interconnectivity between our towns and key gateways and a desire to reduce congestion at key points. The term most congested is a subjective one and will often be dependent on the season, the time of day and ongoing events. And as such, it is not possible to compile a ranked list of worst congestion points. I am mindful, however, that we cannot simply look to build our way out of congestion by creating more and more roads. Rather, I am determined to offer real alternatives to reduce our dependence on private car use and reduce emissions, including a drive towards modal shift through improved public transport and active travel options. That does not mean to say that certain parts of our road network cannot benefit from major works projects in line with the Executive's commitment to flagship schemes in its programme for government, and indeed the British and Irish government's commitments in New Decade, New Approach, my department is advancing major road improvement schemes on the A5, A6, and at the York Street interchange to alleviate congestion and increase journey time reliability. In addition, major works on the A1 are also being developed to improve road safety, these strategically important schemes have been identified as having the ability to deliver for communities and help to address regional imbalance while supporting connectivity and economic growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I uh, thank the Minister for her response. But uh, I think if you did a survey, Minister, of uh, motorists, uh, road users, both commercial and private, I think they would identify the York Street Junction as probably uh, the busiest uh, junction in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it does cause delays to Holliers and Stanton. Traffic causes uh, a, a lot of pollution in that, uh, in that area. And I know it has completed the, uh, the planning process, uh, but the Minister has paused development. I know you alluded to it uh, to the previous question. But can I ask the Minister, uh, could she suggest a time scale? Uh, when we'll see this link between the M1, the M2, and my North Down uh, constituency being built. I thank the member for his question. Uh, I know he has huge interest in this project. Uh, and as I said, it is a strategic road improvement scheme that will provide a fully grade separated interchange to replace the existing at grade signal control junction of the A12 Westlink M2 and M3. And I do recognise the strategic importance of this project. Its inclusion in the new decade new approach agreement is a further indication of the significance of the project to our economic and societal well-being, and I am determined to see it delivered. 
In advance of the next stage of the scheme and in line with good practice, as I said, I have commissioned that short, sharp external review. That's been informed by stakeholders and specialists to ensure that any scheme is fit for purpose and will be completed um, by the end of this year. We will then move through the statutory processes and I would be keen to move this, pro this project forward in the right way, making sure it's the right project that's fit for purpose and future-proofed. Uh, but I'm keen to see delivery of this for a number of the reasons that the member has highlighted as quickly as possible. Thank the Minister for her answers so far. Uh, Air Pollution Minister is, is a serious issue here in the North, particularly in Belfast, where one in every 24 deaths is linked to long-term exposure to air pollution. Uh, given the seriousness of that and the fact that transport is massively responsible for a lot of the air pollution, what is the Department's uh, overarching strategy to deal with air pollution and make our cities cleaner, healthier places to live in? I thank the member for his question. My starting point that is everybody has the right to have, um, has the right to not have the air that's around them polluted. And there's a social justice element to this. Um, because I think even of my own constituency in North Belfast, it's inner city parts of North Belfast that have the greatest levels of air pollution and also uh, by no coincidence, have the highest level of respiratory illnesses uh, among children uh, and among basically residents of, of all ages. So I agree with him, it is an absolute uh, priority. I'm trying to address it through a number of ways uh, park and rides, to try and take private car use off, promoting active travel, particularly in and around our schools with our young people, looking at the development of quiet streets in those inner city neighbourhoods so that their area is not dominated by vehicles but is actually for play and children. You will also be aware that TransLink have a, have a strategy around um, zero emission and low emission buses. I have gave a significant financial contribution to that in my allocation uh, uh, this year. So I am very keen to do what we can in promoting active travel, promoting greater use of our public transport network. And I'm also very keen to work with ministerial colleagues, including the Minister for Environment, uh, as we try to improve the air quality of all of our citizens. Two minutes left. I call Pat Cadney. Mm -hmm. Uh, Minister, thank you for your questions. Uh, Minister, park and rides are one way to remove congestion. Uh, the Minister has already done great work in bringing forward new works. Can I get an update on her consideration of a park and ride at Moira? I agree with the member that park and rides have a very important role to play in tackling uh, traffic congestion, uh, promoting cleaner air and also um, tackling the climate emergency. And that's why I was delighted to announce £2.8 million in investment in park and rides earlier this year. The member is a real champion for Moira and I am. I know he is determined to see this park and ride delivered and I can assure him so am I. Uh, and I hope to be in a position very soon to announce another tranche of funding in the coming months. And yes, subject to all processes being satisfied, uh, my hope is that Mora can be included to help ensure that his constituents have access to cleaner, greener travel. And that ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we will move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Pat Sheehan. I and I listened to the minister answer a question about uh, funding from the Dublin government for infrastructure projects. Uh, and I'm sure she'll agree with me that uh, the Dublin government should honour that commitment, uh, and specifically around the, the construction of the A5. But following on from the Dublin government's announcement uh, about north-south projects, do we have an indication of how and when that funding will be made available? I thank the member for his question, and as he rightly points out, New decade, new approach is the basis upon which all of the parties are around the executive table. We signed up to that in good faith, and that agreement contains a number of commitments, commitments from the Irish government, commitments from the British government, and commitments from the Northern Ireland executive that need to be honoured. Um, I welcome the announcement of the 500 million euro. Um, I'm very keen to work with uh, my colleagues uh, right across this island to see delivery on that. Um, I will push through my end around the infrastructure in my engagement at the North-South Ministerial Councils, but also in my individual engagements with Minister Ryan and, and obviously with the Taoiseach. And I'm sure that's the same approach that will be adopted by all of our ministerial colleagues. 
Thank the Minister for that. Uh, and, and on the subject of all island connectivity, could the Minister comment on the recent North South Ministerial Council and specifically whether the indefinite suspension of the bus air uh, service between uh, Dublin and Belfast got a mention at all? Yes, um, I think it was in, in, in answer to the question from um, Sinead Bradley, um, where it indicated that yes, I did raise the, the issue of Bussarin. Um, Bussarin is a commercial service and it has announced its intention to cease services on the 15th uh, of November. I am very much committed to maximising public transport. I am very much committed to ensuring that we have all island connectivity and, in particular, that people are able to access public transport north and south. So I am working with TransLink to see what we can do, not just to ensure the protection of the services we provide, but what opportunities there may be for growth. And I am due to engage in a number of bilaterals with the Finance Minister uh, in coming weeks and hope to further discuss this matter with him. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her previous answers. In a previous uh, answer, she said that she would try and facilitate uh, driving tests for those that had to be cancelled and booked during the restriction period. And I appreciate she's also going to look toward cancellations, but it's still potentially up to a three month wait for some students who would have been even doing their tests today. Is there any opportunity to try and bring it forward any sooner? Look, uh, you know, I agree that this is a hugely frustrating situation for learner drivers, for driving instructors. Um, and as an executive, we didn't take this decision uh, lightly. Uh, we were already starting from a difficult starting point. It is a high demand service. It was closed for five to six months. Um, but what we are trying to do is to minimise the disruption. So we will be bringing additional slots online through November and December. As I said, we're recruiting 27 new examiners. We're also looking to see can we enhance uh, testing at the weekend, subject to road safety um, conditions. Um, and also very keen that the disruption that's been caused to those, those groups, uh, that this group of, of learner drivers, that we try to minimise that, which is why when we open the slots in February, they will be exclusively for those candidates and pupils who have had their tests cancelled during this four-week period. But I want to apologise to learner drivers and to driving instructors. I don't want to see them in this situation, but we are in a pandemic. This is a public-facing service. It has been impacted, but I want to do what I can to ensure the safety of all involved, but that we get services back up and running as quickly as possible for people. Claire Shogden, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's attention on this matter, and I do see that she's trying to, to bring these forward as quick as possible. I'm also glad that she's thinking outside of a 9 to 5 Monday to Friday week. That's something we need to do right across all um, uh, civil service and public sector uh, services. Um, to come back to the question around providing financial support for driving instructors, all MLAs have been inundated, including my constituency colleague, uh, Cara Hunter. Um, do you have any role in, in supporting the, the Minister for Economy and bringing forward such a scheme so that we can ensure, hopefully by this weekend, that they will actually get financial support? So when this matter was discussed um, in the executive meeting uh, on Friday, uh, I assured the Minister and followed up and in writing, assuring um, the Economy Minister of my support and offering my officials. I'm very mindful that the Department for Economy is under immense pressure. Uh, we do have information related to driving instructors that I'd be very willing to share, uh, but I'm very keen to work with all executive colleagues to ensure that the driving instructors uh, get the financial support that they deserve, given it is the executive's restrictions that have closed their businesses. I call Linda Dillon. Can the Minister give us an update on any actions being taken to provide financial assistance to the transport sector in terms of coach providers, hauliers, taxis and, and others? I thank the member for her question. From the onset of this pandemic, I have consistently said that I don't have the powers to create financial hardship schemes. I wasn't saying this to be obstructive. I was saying it because it was the truth. That fact was recognised when the First and Deputy First Minister wrote to me to say they were considering giving me new powers under the Financial Assistance Act. Following that, I have engaged very closely um, with the sectors. They have worked very closely with my officials in providing the evidence that is required by this piece of legislation, which has to determine that exceptional circumstances uh, apply. I had set a deadline of the 6th of October for receipt of that evidence. The sector themselves asked for an extension, we granted that extension because we want to make sure we have robust evidence. So the um, extension was granted until Friday passed. 
I met with the First and Deputy First Minister yesterday, uh, and my intention is to write to them this week to set out the exceptional circumstances, while my officials are also actively considering what schemes we can bring forward as required. I'm very mindful that within this, these sectors, people were excluded from previous schemes, that they are under real financial hardship, and so I've committed to doing what I can as quickly as possible to make sure that they can get financial assistance. But I have to say, I am as frustrated as them that they have had to wait for several months. Uh, and my view on this is that we could have inc included them in some of the previous existing schemes. But we are where we are, and I will do what I can to help them as quickly as possible. Linda Dillon, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. Two points, Minister. Firstly, I believe that some of the coach operators have actually offered up some plans and solutions, and I think that those need to be looked at. There won't be a perfect answer for everybody in the industry, and I don't think we should wait until we have the perfect answer. We do need to deliver for them and deliver for them now. And secondly, can you give us a, a timeline of when they actually will get financial assistance? Because I accept that you needed the special powers, but I'm not right in saying that the finance minister used those special powers to turn around within days financial assistance for those in Derry that came under the restrictions just two weeks ago. And you're right in respect of the finance minister, but he had an existing scheme which was very straightforward in essence because it relied on LPS to be identifying businesses of rateable value. Um, the sector, as people will know, the haulage sector, the bus and uh, private operator sector, the taxi sector is very diverse. Um, you have self-employed, you have companies with multiple sizes of employees, um, so it, they're two very different schemes. You're right to say that the private bus and coach operators uh, have provided um, very, very good analysis and have provided ideas of schemes, and in fact, those are the basis upon which my officials are working. I don't want to be, I'm not in a position to give a definitive timescale right now because I think people need honesty, and we need to be very open and honest in terms of our um, engagement with them and uh, management of their expectations. Um, but just as recently as last night, my officials were in contact with them, and we work, will work as quickly as possible to get the money out because we recognise time is of the essence. I call Mark Durgan. Thank you, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The Minister has mentioned her work with her counterpart, Minister Ryan, on moving forward all island rail, and I very much welcome that we finally have a Minister who has included Derry and the North West. I know uh, the Minister has been working in partnership with Into the West on Phase 3 of the Derry Belfast Line. Can the Minister give us an update on her work to get this project back on track? after it was halted by her predecessor, Chris Hazard. I thank the member um, for his question. Um, in December 2016, the then Infrastructure Minister, um, Chris Hazard, announced that the planned Phase 3 works were not to be carried out within the budget period 2017 to 2021, but they would remain on TransLink's longer-term infrastructure strategy. However, in line with my commitment to improve connectivity to the North West, I am determined to bring this project back on track. That is why I announced on the 10th of June that I have made funding available for an updated feasibility study for Phase 3 of the Derry Coal Rail Line. While an updated feasibility study is necessary after almost 10 years of delay, I am fully committed to getting this work done at pace and to making progress for the people of the North West who have waited too long for action to address regional imbalance uh, and better connection for them, for them as a community. Uh, thank you, Mark Dargan, supplementary. Thank you, uh, thank you, Minister, for that uh, positive answer. It will be very well received in my constituency. Is there any update on the feasibility study from these positive discussions that have been ongoing? Um, well, last month I held a second and very constructive meeting with representatives of the Rail Lobby Group into the West, following on from my request for TransLink to re-examine the timeline for the completion of the feasibility study and associated business case. I am pleased to announce that this has now been reduced by six months and should therefore be completed in early 2022. I will, of course, continue to do all that I can to make sure that we move forward on this project apace. Call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Minister indeed for her answer so far. And may I ask her how we are getting along with the decision making process around ARC 21's RHI2 incinerator in High Town? I thank the member for his question. He never misses uh, an opportunity. And so my response will be, as it has been before, that all planning applications have to be processed um, with the right strategy processes. When those processes are completed and planning officials have fully considered them, then a recommendation will come up to me. And of course, as planning minister, I will ensure that all of the strategy processes are followed in all applications that I have to take decisions on.
Steve Bacon, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her response, and yet again we shall continue. We will be sparring for this for a very long time until RHI 2 is put where it belongs, nowhere. But I think there is a significant issue here that I would like the Minister to consider. Would she consider commissioning an independent review to the business case to ARC 21, bearing in mind the disquiet people in Northern Ireland have over RHI and indeed over the ROC scheme? And we do not want to see ourselves in a position where, yet again, we are subsidising something that, again, will not support the people of Northern Ireland. And the, and the member will be aware that, as the Minister with responsibility for planning, I have very clear processes to follow, and I will, of course, fully consider uh, any of the applications that come before me. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister for an update on <laughs> Colin McGrath? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for an update on the flood alleviation scheme that is required in Newcastle uh, after the dreadful flooding that took place there just back in August? I thank the member for his question. Uh, and having gone down and been with residents and seen the devastation uh, caused and the damage by flooding, he will be aware that I gave a commitment to the residents that I would do everything that I can to see this uh, flood alleviation scheme um, accelerated. Uh, work is ongoing. Uh, we're moving to procurement of contractors. Uh, officials are working to a timeline where construction will begin in early 2021. But as I said to officials, and I've said to elected representatives, representatives. I have asked my officials to ensure that everything that can be done is being done to accelerate this project. Colin McGrath, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome those comments? Um, as the Minister said, we were there that day and saw the devastation that was caused to people's houses, um, to their gardens, uh, to their streets. And much of that devastation uh, occurred because this work hasn't taken place. It's been lying around for many years, waiting to be delivered. Could I ask the Minister again for a personal commitment to reiterate that personal commitment that was given to the people, those residents, on that day, that this scheme will be delivered, that as soon as it can start, it will start, because that's what people want to hear. I very much appreciate that when your home has been flooded, um, you will not be satisfied by warm words. Uh, so, As Minister, I will be judged by my actions in respect of this project. I have gave a personal commitment to it. I asked my officials for very regular updates on it. I have sent a very clear message to my officials that I want this um, accelerated. Um, there were land issues. We are working very quickly to resolve those. And in addition to the flood alleviation scheme, uh, the member will also be aware that we have set up a community resilience group uh, in the area as well, so that we can work collectively to try to protect homes until we get to a point where we have the flood alleviation scheme in place to provide the prevention required. I to call uh, Joanne Bunding, and there won't be time for supplementary. I'll bundle them together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <laughs> the minister will know. Um, from our previous experience, that the standard response time to elected reps from DFI Roads is 28 days. Um, the Minister may also be aware that whenever you send a reminder to chase the response, it's another 28 days added on to your tally. So, given that some issues are urgent and some are time bound, has she or will she give consideration to a dedicated email address or telephone number for elected representatives to allow us to pursue matters of urgency in a more efficient and effective manner? I thank the member for her question. Um, I get mixed feedback on this. I have a number of members right across the House who say that they get a very efficient and effective response. Um, I would encourage members that you know, if you aren't getting a satisfactory response, it do come through to the private office. Uh, and I will personally uh, look at it. But I will take away the issue that the member has raised and give it some very careful consideration. But I would say, if you're not getting a satisfactory response, then please contact me directly through my private office. Point of order, Mr. Reagan. Uh, I would like to apologise for chundering from a sedentary position. I might have sounded a bit like an honourable member from uh, sort of South Belfast, but I apologise profusely. But you sounded like a member from South Andrew. But anyway, so thank you very much for that point of order. <laughs> Could members uh, take their ease, please, while we uh, prepare the room?